Well, good evening. I can now introduce myself. I am David Dvorkin, uh, Curator of Astronomy here at the Air and Space Museum. And on behalf of Christopher Brown, our acting director, and, if I might presume, on behalf of Ellen Stofan, who will become our new director at the end of the month, I want to welcome you tonight to the second installment of our 2018 Exploring Space Lecture Series. We're delighted to have Dr. Ken Sembach with us as our invited speaker tonight. Our program this year, as it has in past years, is sponsored by United Launch Alliance and by Aerojet Rocketdyne. This partnership making our Exploring Space Lecture Series possible over the past years is especially gratifying to me as it exemplifies what is best about the collaborative spirit of the American aerospace industry. Tonight we have representing uh, Aerojet, Susan Nelson in the audience. And <laughs> I, I must say we ha had just a delightful chance to chat about the future of things in space uh, over a little dinner. Our lecturer tonight is Dr. Kenneth Sembach. He is the director of the Space Telescope Science Institute based on the Johns Hopkins University campus in Baltimore. Now, the Space Telescope Science Institute is abbreviated STSCI, and I'll say that very fast, but I want you to remember that. It's known far and wide. It is the national facility. It is a national observatory that coordinates and oversees the science done with the Hubble Space Telescope. Now, if that wasn't enough for his institution, STSCI will also now be the coordinating body managing the science done with the James Webb Space Telescope after it launches. Given these vast responsibilities, it's especially fitting that Dr. Sembach asks tonight, the question tonight, is astronomy ready for the James Webb Space Telescope? This is the sort of thing that historians have been asking about new instrumentation for centuries. And I must say, I'm fascinated with what we'll learn tonight. Ken Senbach is exquisitely well qualified to ask that question and also to answer it. He received a BA in physics with honors in 1988 from the University of Chicago and a PhD in astronomy in 1992 from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, one of the most productive centers for space astronomy in the United States. From there, he was named a NASA Hubble Fellow at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and then from there moved to Johns Hopkins to become the deputy pro pro project scientist for NASA's far ultraviolet spectroscopic explorer, and we called it in the warm-up, that's FUSE, the Far Ultraviolet Spectroscope. And you know they employ people to come up with these acronyms. <laughs> he was responsible for managing some of its most demanding programs, and it certainly it was a very creative uh, explorer of the ultraviolet universe. He's been at Johns Hopkins ever since, joining STSCI to take on a wide range of responsibilities ranging from the scientific, the operational, and the managerial aspects of making Hubble work right, becoming its director in 2015. Dr. Sembach has contributed well over 175 scientific papers in broad areas of modern astrophysics, becoming the recipient of many of astronomy's most visible awards and prizes. He is no doubt destined for more. He has made critical co contributions to better understanding the physical properties of the material that lurks between the stars and between the galaxies. He studied how galaxies collide with this intervening material, primordial material, if you like. And from these interactions has come to better understand how the chemical elements in the universe developed over cosmic time. He enjoys assembling and working with teams of talented people, each, of course, universes unto themselves, colliding, to achieve, to achieve extraordinary results, as well as being an inspiration to young people to become engaged in science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. 
Now, the question I have in my mind is, are we ready for Ken Senbach? <laughs> Thank you for that kind introduction, David. And uh, it's nice to see so many of you in the audience tonight. Um, as I was thinking about this talk, uh, I reflected back a lot on um, what I was doing at, a, at an earlier time in my life. And we, we kind of got into that a little bit in the question and answer session. So I'm going to take you on a little bit of tour, a bit, bit of a tour of some of the things that influenced me and um, see if we can actually answer that question. Uh, is astronomy ready for the James Webb Space Telescope? And I will just say, this is a big screen. So <laughs> hold on to your seats. Um, all right. So this is not the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, this is the Hubble Space Telescope, orbiting 350 miles above the Earth. And we're all familiar with Hubble. And we put telescopes above the Earth above the atmosphere, because the atmosphere blurs images when we take them with the telescopes on the ground. But when we take them with Hubble, they're much clearer, much sharper. And we don't have to see through that atmosphere. And in fact, we can zoom in on regions of the universe that we couldn't see so clearly before. And this little, this little slideshow here is just showing you one such region that Hubble's looked at. And you look at all the stars in that image. That's a cluster of stars. You can, what do you see about when you look in that? What do you see? You see the stars are different colors. There are red stars, which are cooler and older. There are blue stars, which are hotter and younger. So you know the colors and the, um, the ages and the temperatures of the stars are related. Those smaller stars that you see, the little dots, uh, those are stars like the sun, like our star. So suddenly you realize we're not so special that, in fact, there are lots of stars out there that we can see. And Hubble really shows us that. Now, when I was a young boy, um, when I had that field guide that I talked about, I went out and I looked for things in the sky and I could find my way around the sky. But I had to pick up a book like this to actually learn about what was in it. This is a, one of the books that I had checked out from the library. This is actually a slightly newer version. Uh, this one is in the mid-1970s. The version I um, took out was in, from the 60s. But in that book, there are these color plates, only a few pages out of the 500 pages in this book. But I was amazed at these pictures, pictures like you see on the screen here. These were, these were the universe for me. These were what I should be seeing. Now, we know that today it's possible to produce images that are more colorful than these single color images like were in the book that I just showed you. And when you zoom in on these images, you see that, in fact, it's like we just saw. There are millions of stars. And this image is about 100,000 stars. It wasn't just stars, though. It was planets. I grew up in the, the, high, the heyday of the space age, the early parts of the space age, when we were sending rockets up with experiments not just to study the moon, but to study the planets in the solar system. Here are a couple of images from that book taken by the Pioneer 11 spacecraft that flew by both Jupiter and Saturn. These were the best images we had of these planets at the time. Here's what they look like with Hubble. And this is another reason for being in space, something that you see here that you don't see every day. You see the aurora on these two giant planets. These are like the northern lights or the southern lights for these planets. And you see those in ultraviolet light, light that doesn't penetrate the atmosphere. So not only do we want to get above the blurring effects of the atmosphere, you want to see wavelengths of light that you can't actually see from the ground. And as spectacular as these images are, they're nothing compared to some of the images that we're getting back from spacecraft like Juno. This is Jupiter, as seen by Juno. You look at this image, it's mind-boggling, the level of detail that's in it, all of the weather that's going on in the outer layers of this giant planet. 
or you look at the images of Saturn taken by the Cassini mission when it flew by before it plunged into the planet last year. And the rings, the fine rings that you can't resolve from the ground. And even Hubble can't resolve all of them. And then this image, one of the most amazing images I think I've ever seen. An image that captures all of humanity in just a few pixels. Everything that we've ever known, ever done, all civilization, right there. Looking back, again, kind of makes you feel small. Don't worry, I've got more of that coming. <laughs> That's just warm up. We're just in the solar system. This is just 900 million miles away. We're, we're going to go halfway across the universe here tonight, folks. Um, but no, the, think about this, the, the, the engineering feat that has to occur in order for us to even think about obtaining an image like that. These kinds of things I didn't have when I was a kid. Uh, you know, I had the, the things in the book, and I had the stars in the sky. These were my pale blue dots, my blue marbles up in the sky. I lived on the south side of Chicago. I didn't have many dots in the sky. But the bright ones I could see, and I could find my way around. And when I would do that, I would then want to know what, you know, what else is there. And so I'd turn to the pages of those books. And I fell in love with the images, especially the gas and dust images, places where stars are forming. This is an image of the Horsehead Nebula in Orion in that book. And it's up here in the constellation Orion. Many of you have probably seen this. Uh, constellation in the winter sky at night. Let me zoom in on it. Sorry if I'm making you dizzy. I'm getting a little wobbly up here too. And then you realize, actually, there's more to see than that. Because when you start to look at it in light, it's just redward of what the eye can see in the infrared. And Hubble has a little bit of infrared light capability. You see that, in fact, the universe is very dark. And in fact, these kinds of images are very beautiful and ethereal and full of information that the book didn't have or that we didn't have from ground-based optical data or even Hubble optical data. This is a horse in a whole new light. This isn't just nebulae, it's galaxies. Millions of stars, perhaps 100 billion stars in a galaxy like this, if we could look at our own from the outside, It'd be a pinwheel-shaped galaxy like this, the Whirlpool Galaxy. And every one of these little red blobs that you see in here is a blob like that Horsehead Nebula, where stars are forming. Stars maybe like our own sun are forming. And you see all of the detail in this galaxy, the dust and the gas and the spiral arms, the red regions lit up here in hydrogen light, uh, the light of neutral hydrogen, where you see uh, the light uh, uh, being emanated by new stars being formed and uh, down deep in the center of that galaxy where you can't even resolve all of the stars. How many of you have seen this image, right? Eagle Nebula, the pillars of creation. It's one of the iconic Hubble images. Little did I know 40 years ago, 45 years ago, that that image was sitting at, looking at right at me in the book. Does everybody see it? On the left-hand side there. There it is. It was in the image that I liked probably the most in that book, never realizing what was really in there, in the Hubble image. That's a recent Hubble image taken just after the last servicing mission in 2009. And you can see, again, in all that detail, we call it the pillars of creation because there are probably stars forming in there. And when you look at that image, you realize there's so much more detail there than you had before. But we're missing part of the story, because when you look at that with infrared light, you see right through it. And you see deeper into it. And again, you see it in a different way. There's so much more to learn when you have the ability to see these regions in both the optical and the infrared light. In this case, you see right through some of this nebula and see the stars in the universe behind it. 
In other cases, you can see right down into those regions where the stars are forming. And these aren't, these aren't unique. Right? Hubble produces images like this all the time. They're in schools. They're in museums. They're in this museum. If you walk out into the hallway, you'll see some of these same images out there, whether it's stars in star-forming regions or stars in their death rows, stars that are shedding off their outer layers or interacting with their surrounding medium when they've exploded. Galaxies, big aggregations of stars, maybe 100 billion stars in a galaxy, maybe more in some cases. Uh, Pinwheel-type galaxies like our own, others that are interacting and colliding with each other, evolving as the universe um, goes on in time, sometimes being ripped apart, other times forming even more stars as they coalesce together in a violent collision um, under the influences of gravity. And you realize then, too, that the universe is extremely large and that there are galaxies everywhere you look. There are great groupings of galaxies called clusters and clusters of clusters called superclusters and so forth. And those galaxies don't all look the same. Some look as if they're being torn apart, like this one down in the lower left-hand corner. That's actually an optical trick that the universe is playing on us. There's so much mass in that cluster of galaxies that it's distorting that light that we're seeing. It's actually warping the space. And as the light from that galaxy passes to us, that's actually multiple images of that galaxy uh, uh, coming to us, all because of that warping of the light. And galaxies don't look the same everywhere. When you look further back in time, they look fuzzier and blobbier and less structured. They look smaller. And of course, they look redder. And we'll get to that in just a moment. So here's one of the other iconic images. How many of you have seen this image? Right? This is one of the most famous Hubble images as well. It's hanging on the wall of my office, on the wall of a lot of offices here in Washington, DC. Uh, it's a fantastic image. It's a mind-boggling image. There are only two stars that you can see in that image. Everything else is galaxies or collections of stars. The two stars are the ones with the, the cross-like spikes. There's one down here, and there's one in the upper left-hand corner there. Everything else you see, 10,000 galaxies in that image. 10,000. In a piece of the sky that's no bigger than if you held a drinking straw up to your eye and you looked at it through the drinking straw. Compared to the size of the full moon, it's small. What does that tell you? It tells you there's probably 200 billion galaxies in the universe. And we now know from what we don't see in that image that there might be as many as 10 times more than that, 2 trillion galaxies in the universe. And it's only a small piece of the sky. There's 12 or 13 more million pieces of the sky just like that. When you think about that, that's a lot of stars. 200 billion trillion. Okay. Let's say the odds of a star, of a star having a planet like the Earth is one in a billion. Still means there's 200 trillion of them out there. <laughs> we're not alone. We're not alone. We may not have communicated yet, but we're not alone. So this deep field, why is it such an iconic image? Well not just because it has so many galaxies, but because it shaped the way we think about the universe. We realize that galaxies change with time. You're moving through this image, and in fact, you're moving back in time. Each slice going through it is a slice in time. We know where all those galaxies are, so we can place them back in time. And as you move through this image, you realize that the galaxies you're seeing are changing. They're getting smaller. Some of them are getting redder. There are fewer of them, fewer and fewer and fewer. And the question naturally becomes, does the universe run out of galaxies? What's happened here? What's beyond what Hubble can see? Is there anything beyond what Hubble can see? And we need a different kind of telescope to see 
the infrared light of those first galaxies, the galaxies that are beyond Hubble's vision. And why do I say you need an infrared telescope to see that? Well, it turns out that the universe is expanding. And light emitted by a galaxy leaves that galaxy one color, and it arrives, and we see it a redder color. It's because the light itself is stretched as the universe expands. So as the fabric of space stretches, the light itself becomes redder. Distant objects move away from us faster than nearby objects, and as a result, they appear redder than nearby objects. This is called Hubble's law, not because of the telescope, but because of Edwin Hubble, astronomer in the early 20th century, who first plotted this relationship between the recession velocity of the galaxy and its distance. So things that are moving away faster are more distant and therefore more redshifted. They appear redder. Now, electromagnetic spectrum. Hubble sees light like we do with our eyes, visible light. It also sees a little bit of ultraviolet light and a little bit of infrared light. But even a mighty Hubble can't see what's beyond the Hubble deep field. That light might have started off as optical light or even ultraviolet light, but it's been shifted by the expansion of the universe into a region of the infrared spectrum that it can no longer see. We think of infrared light as heat. You feel it as heat when you stand out in the sun. Here are some images of a train and a cat taken in infrared camera light. Um, and you can see it. things look different when you depict them in infrared light. But what you're seeing there is a heat map. And so that's effectively what we're looking for. We're looking for that early light that now appears as infrared light or heat from the early universe. And this is the telescope, or more appropriately, this is a model of the telescope, a full-scale model that was on the grounds of the Goddard Space Flight Center of the James Webb Space Telescope. And you can see that's not an ordinary looking telescope. Um, first off, it's bigger than Hubble. Um, how many of you have seen Hubble out in the galley here? Yeah, everybody, right? It's much bigger than Hubble. Uh, and Hubble itself is the size of a school bus. So its primary mirror is bigger. And that primary mirror is actually 18 segmented mirrors, hexagonal segments put together to form one big mirror. And there's another structure um, called sun shield that keeps the sun's rays and the moon and the earth light off of that telescope. Remember, this is a heat sensing telescope and you don't want any sunlight or earth light or moonlight shining on those mirrors because they exhibit heat. And you don't want heat from the telescope. You don't, you don't want the telescope to be warm. You want that telescope to be cold, a couple hundred degrees below zero when it's out in space. That telescope has a couple of interesting features. One is that segmented mirror. Light comes in, hits off of the primary mirror, the segments up to the secondary, and then back through the middle of the primary into an instrument package where the light gets analyzed by a set of instruments, cameras, spectrographs, coronagraphs, advanced instrumentation that can break the light into its component colors, that can allow us to see faint things in the vicinity of bright things and so forth, produce images like we've seen with Hubble. This sun shield, five layers, very thin mylar-like film, protects the telescope from that earth and sun and moonlight. And then, whoops. And then solar panels uh, underneath, obviously on the sun side. Now, how do you actually put a telescope that size in space? Well, the reason it's the funny shape it is, and the reason it's segmented near t primary, is because you need to fold it up. And when you put it into a rocket, it looks like it does in this configuration. And so here's a little short video of that telescope unfolding and the, and the shield deploying once it's up in space. 
And so you get the five layers, and they get pulled out and then tensioned. And it, as that happens, the whole telescope is cooling down very rapidly. You've got to put the secondary and the, the primary mirror wings into place before everything freezes. Uh, and eventually, this is what it looks like. It's going to be located about a million miles from the Earth at a point in space called the second Lagrange point. This is a semi-stable point in space around which it'll orbit. It's kind of a point in space where the gravitational influence of the Earth and the Sun balance so that things at that location stay more or less in that location. Now you say, OK, that's great, Ken, but there are 18 mirrors. That's not one mirror. Well, you're right. Um, and in fact, what you have when you first look at light with that telescope is 18 fuzzy blobs in the upper left there. And our job will be to make sure that we take those fuzzy blobs and focus them and then align them into 18 individual images and then phase that light so that it becomes a single image and those 18 segments act as a single primary mirror that's six and a half meters in diameter, which will give us exquisite resolution and lots of light collecting ability. Here's a picture of that telescope at the Johnson Space Center from last summer when it just came out of the large, largest thermal vacuum chamber in the world um, that was outfitted to create space-like conditions for this telescope to be tested. This is just the telescope. It doesn't have the spacecraft or the sun shield on it at this point. But the telescope and the instrument package are there. The Atlantic Magazine ranked this as one of their um, most inspirational images of 2017. One of their most hopeful images, I should say. And I agree. I think this is an incredibly hopeful image. Um, you see engineers standing by this amazing engineering feat, looking upward, almost as if looking to the sky. The possibilities here are endless. I'm going to talk a little bit about the optics for this telescope, um, because it's one of many technological breakthroughs that had to happen. I know that John Mather in his last talk talked a little bit about the beryllium that was used to make these tel uh, telescope segments. Um, but those telescope segments have been all over the country, whether they've, you know, the ore, the beryllium that was used to, to fabricate them was mined out in Utah, uh, shaped in Ohio, and moved all over the country in terms of testing and finalizing uh, the shape of these mirrors. There were 14 stops uh, that those mirrors had to go through. And they're lightweight. Beryllium is a very lightweight substance. Um, um, it's a very dangerous substance to work with. Um, but when it's handled properly, it can do amazing things. Uh, in this case, these mirrors, if they had been Hubble-sized, they would have weighed about 250 kilograms, about 500 pounds. Instead, they weigh about 40. Um, and that's important because Launching a mirror like Hubble, this size, hard, really hard, heavy. So the compromise is you build them out of something that's lighter weight, and um, you deploy them. Now, these mirrors are polished so smoothly that if you were to expand one of them to the size of the United States, the average deviation on the surface of that mirror would only be about three inches. No Rocky Mountains, no Mississippi River, three inches across the entire United States. Amazing. But you know what? That's not the most amazing part of that. That's actually fairly straightforward. The hard part of that is that you're going to take these mirrors and you're going to take them from room temperature down to hundreds of degrees below zero. Well, what happens when you cool something? It changes shape. That's one of the nice properties of beryllium, and the most important property for this telescope. It doesn't change shape that much with temperature changes. The problem is it still changes. And so these mirrors actually had to be polished at room temperature to the wrong shape so that when they get cooled down, they're the right shape. Yeah, whoa, exactly. <laughs> That's everybody's reaction. Uh, yeah, that, that's, that's scary. That's scary hard. Um, that was 
that was new technology that had to be developed in order for that to happen. It's an optical and an engineering marvel. The other big um, piece of the telescope here is the sun shield. And remember, heat seeking telescope, got to make it cold, got to shield it from the sun. So we have this kind of quart sized sun shield with the five layers that have to be deployed. And think about that. How do you deploy something that's the size of a tennis court? How do you fold it up? You have to figure out how to fold it, unfold it, fold it, unfold it, fold it, unfold it, to test it, and you gotta fold it all up again and make sure that it works in space. And it's important because you're providing thermal protection here. It's 400 degrees in space on the hot side, the bottom side of that sun shield. By the time you get up to that fifth layer, it's 185 degrees below zero. So almost 600 degree change from the top side to the bottom side. That's the equivalent of an SPF of about a million. <laughs> and something that has to work right. If that, if that sun shield doesn't deploy, that's it. Those instruments, the telescope, everything else is optimized to be cold. It wants to be cold. And we need it to be cold to see those galaxies and to see into those star forming regions and to see those planets around other stars that we're not seeing now with Hubble. And so what are we gonna be looking for? We're gonna be asking where is the universe's first light? How do galaxies grow and evolve over cosmic time? What are planetary atmospheres made of and how do stars and planets form? Those are big questions, but they break down into two general themes. One is redshift, which we talked about earlier, and one is dust and molecules. Again, talked a little bit about that. With the infrared light, we can see further into these dusty regions because the wavelengths of light are longer. And so astronomers are thinking, and oh boy, are they thinking. They know what they want to do with this telescope. They knew what they wanted to do with this telescope even before Hubble was launched. But, but, we thought we wanted, we knew what we wanted to do with Hubble before it was launched too. And we did those things. But many of the things that we've done with Hubble, the biggest surprises have been things we didn't think about. And that's going to be true with this telescope as, as well. So we're ready to answer the questions that we know how to ask and which questions to ask. We're gonna make sure we're also ready to answer those questions we haven't yet thought about asking. So in these first stars and first galaxies that we're looking at, as we look further and further back in time with Hubble and now with Webb in a few years, we're gonna be looking back closer and closer to the Big Bang, maybe to within a few hundred million years of that 13.7 billion year old universe, a time when it was just barely starting to form galaxies. You look in the Hubble deep field, and what do you do? You look for the very reddest things that you can see, those things that aren't so red that they're shifted out of your ability to detect them, but the reddest things and so astronomers have been cataloging those and getting ready to prepare to observe fields just like this. There are programs that were submitted recently or about to be submitted recently to look at exactly this field uh, and to see exactly what it would look like with the James Webb Space Telescope. And so having those different colors, you see galaxies in a different light, whether it's visible or infrared or even ultraviolet or X-ray. All of that different kind of light gives us different information about how galaxies exist and interact and evolve. What you're seeing on the right-hand side is a simulation of two galaxies interacting through their gravitational influence. And what you see superimposed on that is every now and then the movie stops and shows you a real Hubble image that looks like that simulation. And so you realize how you view these galaxies, not only depends on what kind of light you're looking at, but where in their evolution they are and from what viewing angle you see those galaxies. This is something that was created in our, um, in our outreach um, section at the Institute. I think it's remarkable that they had the foresight to actually be able to go through this simulation and to recognize which Hubble images looked like these things. It's not always the same galaxy, but 
um, you see that different times those colliding galaxies look like different interacting galaxies that we already know exist in the universe. Looking a little bit closer to home into the star forming regions. This is a visible light image of a star forming region in the constellation Carina. Here's a question on the screen for you. Everybody know which one they're gonna choose? I'm gonna put an arrow on there. It's that one. How many of you chose that one? A few of you, oh, very good, very good. Why? Because when you look at that one in infrared light, you suddenly realize something really interesting is going on in that, in that central region. There's a star in there that you can see in the infrared light now when you look through all of that gas. It's spewing out streams of gas out its poles and interacting with that surrounding media. This is a location where a star has just formed um, and it's in its early stages of evolution. So it's clearing out uh, the region around the star as it spews these jets outward, hidden from view for the most part in that optical image. I'll go back to it real quick. Right there. And you see it in the infrared light that Hubble can see. James Webb will see this kind of infrared light, but also more infrared. It'll look further wavelengths, uh, redder wavelengths of infrared light. And so it'll even be able to look deeper into images like this. And we'll look and see what's happening even closer to home. The planets in our own solar system, we'll monitor them with Webb. And we'll be able to look at those patterns of weather that's happening on Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, into the atmospheres. And with Webb, we'll see deeper into the atmospheres than we see with Hubble, because the infrared light penetrates further. And we'll be able to see regions that we can't see with Hubble. We'll look at the planet's moons as well. We'll be able to look for water on moons like Titan or Europa. We'll be able to look at Saturn's rings and the compositions. We'll put very, um, very detailed uh, measurements across the rings there uh, with, the, with the instrumentation on board uh, Webb. And we'll be able to see what those rings are made of. And ultimately, we'll look and we'll see what the atmospheres of planets around other stars look like. In the upper right-hand corner here, you see a transiting exoplanet. And you can see the dip of light when the planet passes in front of the star. This is what we were talking about in the question and answer session. Now, if you look at that planet, and if that planet has an atmosphere, the atmosphere around that planet also absorbs and so the fact that it absorbs its specific wavelengths of light tells you, in some cases, what the atmospheric constituents of that uh, exoplanet are. So we can look for things like water or methane or carbon dioxide or oxygen or ozone. Some of these are in the optical wavelength, but many of them are in the infrared. James Webb will be a water-seeking machine as well. It will find water in the universe, lots of it. We know water is necessary for life, so perhaps even some of those planets, if we're lucky with tests, it will tell us exactly where to look. And maybe some of those planets will actually be able to look at with Webb in this fashion and be able to detect biomarkers like you see up here on the screen. For those cases where we aren't lucky enough, where the planet passes in front of the star, where in fact the planet doesn't circle the star along our line of sight, Webb may also reveal what those planets look like. On the left-hand side, you have an animation of a planet being lost in the glow of a star. We're just taking a Saturn or a Jupiter-sized planet and putting it into the light of a star. But when you put a coronagraph disk in place in this case, and you block the light of that central star, suddenly you can see that planet. Right? Somebody asked earlier about the eclipse. Somebody was looking at my slides. Right? It's the same thing. Only in this case, in this case, hey, that's pretty good. In this case, the moon was the disk, the occulting eclipse, right? 
This is an eclipsograph, right? You see the outer layers of the sun that you wouldn't have normally seen because the moon's blocking the bright portion of the sun. That's the same kind of a technique, only now, instead of using the moon, we're using a disk inside the instrumentation, a mask inside the instrumentation to actually block the light along the optical path. We've done this with Hubble, and you can see these debris disks and these rings um, where these planetary systems are forming. Uh, there's one such system up at the top there. That's what the system will look like, we think, with James Webb down in the lower left. The, the technique that we're going to be using here for Webb is about a 10 to 100 times better than what we can do with Hubble, though. And so we're going to have a lot better um, information about these debris disks and the kinds of regions where planets might form around these kinds of stars. So this is, this is the story. This is the hidden transformation of the universe, all the way from the Big Bang to life as we know it today. Webb is going to illuminate all of that for us. This is the story of the creation of elements, essentially. It's our story, right? Every one of you, everything in this room was inside of a star or more, right? More times than once, several times, everything. The steel, the iron, the aluminum, the titanium in your cars, the calcium in your teeth, the silicon in the sand on your beaches, the carbon, the nitrogen, the oxygen in our plants and our atmosphere, it was all created inside stars. Right? The early universe started out as hydrogen and helium. All of those other elements were fused from those atoms inside stars and then spewed out to eventually become people sitting in a room listening to a guy up at the front with a laser pointer. <laughs> it's, yeah, kind of remarkable. I took my inspiration from the stars in the backyard. And if you're lucky enough on a summer night to go out and look to the south, at least from the northern hemisphere, you see Scorpius and Sagittarius can't miss Antares, one of the brightest stars in the sky. Orange looks a lot like Mars. But the tail of Scorpius is, is clear. The asterism known as the teapot, the eight stars in the teapot in the constellation of Sagittarius. If you take that line from the handle of the teapot and you extend it up through the top of the teapot that much again, you get to one of the most beautiful pieces of the sky with this pair of binoculars. Do it. Dark sky. You won't be sorry. It's fantastic. Right along the Milky Way. And in there, you'll see what I saw in that book by George Abel back in the 1970s. You'll see the Lagoon Nebula. Why am I showing you this picture to end? Because I'm going to give you a little treat. I'm going to show you what this image looks like. And you'll, you'll be some of the only people in the world to have seen this image I'm showing tonight. The rest of the world gets to see it tomorrow <laughs> when we release the 28th anniversary image for Hubble. Put your phones down. <laughs> All right, here we go. Scorpius, Sagittarius, teapot. I zoom into the Lagoon Nebula. Fade into the Hubble image. This is a good one. I'll back it out for you in just a minute, but we'll take you on a little bit of a fly through here. Again, some of our animators did a really nice job of giving you a little bit of a tour here. It's a, it's a, it's a strange image. There's lots happening. There are little blobs of dust and gas with stars embedded. When, you, when this image comes out, make sure you go to our website and you look at the image on your computer screen and you zoom through it in full resolution. Even this screen, my computer doesn't do it for you up on this screen. Um, you'll be amazed. 
you see star, stars like this with little bow shocks around them, right? They're carving out little regions. Uh, hmm? Yeah, it is real, yeah. It goes down, yeah. And again, just, just amazing. So that's a, that's a homework exercise for the audience, but I think one that you'll, you'll enjoy. And there's a nice, uh, a nice release coming out tomorrow with that. So there it is, invisible light. And then it wouldn't be a James Webb talk if we didn't also show you what the infrared light's gonna look like. And I think that's what it'll look like there. So those are two Hubble images of the same region, one in, one in visible light, one in infrared light. Beautiful. All right, so I hope I've given you a little bit of a sense of where I've come from, what the inspiration has been for me, why we're getting ready for web. The answer to my question is, I'm ready for web. I hope you are a little bit more ready for web. The science community is certainly ready for it. Astronomy is ready for it. Astronomy needs this telescope to tell us some of the kinds of things that I was talking about tonight, to really give us a new view of the universe. It's going to be transformative, just like Hubble was transformative. Web will be as well. And with any luck, Web will become as much a household name and a part of, uh, a part of our history as, as Hubble has been. So, Thank you for that. Um, I'd be happy to answer questions that anybody might have. It's been a great audience. Do you have a few other questions? I'm happy to. Yeah. Yep, do we have time? Great. Yep. Yes, sir. Up here. When will the first images be available? Of, when will the first images from Web be available? Um, We'll be calibrating and um, making sure the observatory is commissioned uh, for about six months after it's launched. So end of 2020. Um, I'm hoping maybe we can do that a little more quickly and sneak a few of the engineering images out to you beforehand. Uh, not sneak them out, I mean release them and tell you what's going on with the observatory. I mean, people are gonna wanna know what's happening now and what's Webb looking at. Um, I already know, I think I know, what we're going to be looking at. It's going to be spectacular. Um, David, you want to moderate? Yeah, you just... I, bet, I better. Well, let's start in the front here. Is there any benefit to the delays? Is there any upside to that? Uh, question is, are there any benefits or upsides to the delay? Uh, and the answer is yes. Um, number one, we absolutely need to make sure that we get it right. Right, because of all of the complexity there, the unfolding of the mirrors, the unfolding of that sun shield. Um, unlike Hubble, Webb is not meant to be serviced and repaired in space. So we get one shot at it and it's going a million miles away. So um, we wanna make sure that it works. Um, the, second question, uh, the second answer to your question is, um, yes, it helps us prepare. Um, there's still a lot of work we can do on the ground. Um, getting the, the pipelines and the, um, the techniques that we're going to be using to analyze the data and to getting the science community ready to use that data on day one, um, which we can take advantage of. If I could just add, although this isn't working because I can't figure it out, uh, one, of the most important, one of the most important lessons learned with, with Hubble, uh, I think you have, uh, pretty much overcome with web, and that is all up testing. Yeah. It yeah. just takes time. Yeah. Over here on the white. Yeah. Um, you said the uh, gas giant atmosphere is there. What are you referring to? Are comets, asteroids, or things like that? Um, so the question is, I mentioned gas giants and um, outer planets uh, with web. What are the plans for comets and inner solar system, asteroids and so on. Um, Webb's able to see um, objects at the orbit of Mars or further. So, um, 
Uh, it will be looking at some of those things. We'll certainly look at comets, uh, probably not as close as some of them come uh, to the sun as we have been able to look at with other telescopes, but there are other telescopes up there that we're able to do that with. But yeah, absolutely, uh, we'll be looking at Kuiper Belt objects as well, things that are much further away. Um, uh, solar system's fair game. Yeah. In the pink. In the pink. Yes, there are millions of lines of code. The, the question is, what is there a question, or is, you want to just know a little more about the software? Yes, uh, what are some of the issues that you're dealing with? Um, right, so some of Are you still using DOS? <laughs> <laughs> no. We got rid of it last week. Oh, good, good. Um, the, the question is, what are we doing about all of the software that's needed? Um, and you're, you're right, there are millions of lines of code of software that are required to support the science for this mission, uh, to operate the instrumentation, to do the planning and scheduling for this observatory, to do all of the ingest of the proposals and the conversion of those proposals to the observing specifications, to calibrate all of the data, to archive it, and then to um, actually be able to uh, use all the tools that are available in the uh, archive to pull out the pieces of the data that are necessary for the scientific analysis. So that's one of the things that we work very hard on at the Institute and is one of our main responsibilities, making sure that whole ground system uh, is ready. And uh, you're exactly right. Um, there are things, again, going back to this earlier question, that we'd love to be able to do with this extra year that we've got now that the launch has been delayed. And um, we would be ready. We would have been ready to go even this fall. Um, but um, we're happy to have the extra time uh, to prepare for exactly this. Lots of bugs. Uh, there are lots of bugs, but we're trying to work through all of them. Get rid of those bugs. You now, bet. we have overflow in the planetarium. And I want to uh, give them a chance. Uh, Sean, are there any questions at this moment? I think, okay, well, well, we'll come back to you. There's plenty of hands right here, right in the middle. Yes? What can we learn about dark matter and dark energy from where we Great. What can we learn about dark matter and dark energy? I think Jennifer Wiseman's actually going to tell you something about that in the next lecture, so maybe I shouldn't steal her thunder there. But, um, come back in May. <laughs> she says, go ahead. She says, go ahead. Do it now. Um, dark matter and dark energy, right? If, in case you weren't feeling small and... Uh, 200 billion trillion stars wasn't enough. That's only 5% of the mass of the universe, mass energy budget of the universe. The rest of it is in this dark energy and dark matter. Um, and so uh, with images like I showed of those clusters of galaxies and how those galaxies cluster together and the kinds of distortions that are in those fields, we can actually map out the dark matter composition of those clusters. We're doing that with Hubble now. We'll be able to do that even better with Webb. Um, on the dark energy side, um, being able to have access to the infrared uh, means that we're going to actually be able to probe uh, the supernovae and other um, events that we use to measure the expansion rate of the universe, um, even to higher precision. So we'll be able to get better energy, better dark energy measurements. Um, but there's other telescopes that are actually better suited for some of the more general properties of dark energy. Uh, the Wide Field Infrared Survey Telescope, uh, which will hopefully launch in the mid-2020s, is a Hubble-like uh, mirror donated from the National Reconnaissance Office that NASA is planning to repurpose to look at the universe. And in that case, um, you get a Hubble-like image that's 100 times the field of view of Hubble. So in just, in just 10 weeks, you could survey as much of the universe with that telescope as we've done in, with Hubble over the last 28 years. And, 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 and that will actually revolutionize what we know about dark energy. OK, I'm looking for a demographically different kind of spread there. OK, right back there in the in the dark sweater, yeah, with the stripes.
Oh, I love that question. What are we thinking about now uh, that we want to do 25 years from now? You know what I want 25 years from now? I want a 15 meter version of Hubble. <laughs> no, I'm serious about that because then we actually will be able to take pictures of Earth's around other stars, right? And we actually will be able to survey hundreds, hundreds of Earth-like planets around other stars. And then we'll know, we'll really know whether or not Earth is unique. Um, with a telescope like that, you can resolve everything in the universe to about 300 light years, which means that those big star forming regions, no matter where they are in the universe, you can resolve to that level. So imagine the kind of exquisite detail that you would see there. Again, that's going really deep, um, and that gets to the heart of this tracing of the chemical elements from the beginning of time to now. That telescope is really going to do that. Webb will give us a really good uh, enticement for that, um, but that telescope is going to be needed. For that, we're going to need um, an ability to block the light of those central stars the, uh, that the planets are circling around um, that's out of reach right now. With, with Hubble, we can, we can dim the light of the central star light by about a factor of 100,000. With Webb, a million, maybe 10 million if we're lucky. With W first, a billion, and we still need another factor of 10. And so if we're going to do it with an internal coronagraph like that, we're still developing the technology. Some of our folks are working on that. We're working with folks at JPL and at Goddard. Um, there are others thinking about using big devices like star shades, essentially an artificial moon to put in front of the telescope to block the light. And so lots of people are thinking about how we might uh, create a telescope like that. Right there. Yes. What, uh, the question is, when do I think we'll be able to see first light, and will it be a singularity explosion or um, a clash of big bangs? Um, with this kind of a telescope, we actually can't see back to the big bang. You can only see back um, as far as when uh, the universe becomes transparent to you. You can see back earlier in time with the infrared the cosmic microwave background, microwaves being redder uh, than the infrared light we're talking about here. And that was done with the COBE experiment and WMAP and Planck and so forth. Here, when we're looking for those first stars, they would be supernovae that explode in the very early part of the universe. More likely, we'll see those first galaxies, um, those first collections of stars. Um, I hope we see them right off the bat when we start looking for them. Uh, I don't know whether we will, and it may take longer than we think, but that's something that people are going to be looking at or looking for on day one. We're going to be pushing really deep. So I would, I would hope early on in the, in the mission we'll know how far back in time we can actually look with this telescope. And it should be to within just a few hundred million years of the Big Bang. That's getting right down there. It is. <laughs> now, we have two questions here, and then I'd, I'm giving the planetarium warning if you have any questions. Go ahead. What was that question again? Uh, the question is, will James Webb be able to observe the cold spot in the microwave background? Which cold spot are you talking about? I'm not sure <laughs> I understand the question. The one that's what? I can't hear you. Oh, gosh. I guess yeah. I'm not up on the latest talk. You, you I, got us. I'm not exactly sure. I'm sorry. I can't answer that question. We'll, we'll, have, to, we'll, we'll have to read up on it. Question right here. Ooh, how Question much does it, how cost? Much does it cost? Did you see the 200 trillion billion? <laughs> <laughs> no. no. Um, the, the mission uh, is about $8 billion to develop it. It's right? about, about an aircraft uh, carrier? It's, it's about the amount of money that we spend in this country on Halloween candy. 
Oh, okay. <laughs> That's another way to look at it. Um, a anything from the planetarium? It, Let's go with. Uh, it, 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 it's it's less than the estimated cost. It's less than the estimated cost to. Um, what did they want to do? They just wanted to repave the Baltimore Washington Parkway in '66. It was going to cost some ungodly sum of money, but it actually, isn't it, that's not a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you got to get from one place to another. Absolutely. Um, uh, let's try the planetarium. Do you have a question? Yeah, so if, you, if that mirror were the size of the United States, um, you can only polish a mirror so smoothly, right? There's always a little bit of roughness to it. In this case, that roughness, the average deviation would be no more than three inches on that surface, right? So from, from Maine to California. Uh, if, if you took a regular, you know, shaving mirror or something, anybody ever see a shaving mirror? I'm sorry, shouldn't show my age, but um, if you expanded that to the United States, uh, you would see deviations on the order yeah. of many miles. Yeah. Quite a few miles. Yeah. So that's, that's, the, that's the kind of fidelity you're talking about. Okay, question right here. And Have they decided what launch vehicle will be used? Yeah, the question is, have they decided what launch vehicle is used? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's something that was decided very early on. The telescope will launch on an Ariane 5 rocket, uh, which is being provided by the European Space Agency as part of its contributions to the mission. So um, once, the, once the observatory um, is all ready to go, it's all in pieces right now, the, the telescope and instrument one piece, the sun shield and the spacecraft. It's all in the same room out at Northrop Grumman in Southern California. When all of the testing and the integration of all of that is done and it's packed up, it'll be shipped out of the port uh, at Long Beach, down through the Panama Canal to French Guiana and the, the spaceport for the Europeans down there in Karoo, French Guiana is where it'll launch on an Ariane 5. How many cross fingers do we have? <laughs> okay, there's a question right here. So you said that you hope that Webb becomes a household name like Hubble. Right. And I think that happens if there are pictures like the Solar Exploration that will go up on CNN. But, so my question is, given that it's an infrared telescope, can we expect to get pictures that are going to blow us away? Uh, so the question is, um, can we expect to get pictures from Webb that will blow us away in a fashion that helps make it a household name. Um, that is certainly our goal. <laughs> and I say that with all seriousness. Um, I think some of the infrared pictures I showed you today were pretty good, right? Okay. They're going, the pictures from Webb will be better than that. And, and I think that the real power of those images, at least early, will be in their comparison to what we've seen with those really good optical images. You're right, that's light that we don't normally see and it has to be colorized in a way that we can actually extract information or our brains process what's happening there. Um, but I do think that's possible and we have some very talented people who are very good at that. And so I, I'm, I'm convinced we're gonna see some absolutely stunning images from Webb. In the green. Great question. So uh, she would like me to describe the process somebody goes through to uh, make a Hubble observation. Um, okay, so I'm your average astronomer out there. Actually, I have, I'm gonna be your above average astronomer because I'm gonna write a really good proposal. Once a year. We're He's gonna, got a certain in. We're gonna, we're gonna <laughs> in that, you know. Once a year, we, we put out a call for proposals to the science community and uh, they respond by writing proposals that are judged on their scientific merit by their peers. So we bring about 150 astronomers in from around the world to the Space Telescope Science Institute, and we review, eh, typically in a given year for Hubble, we review about 1,200 proposals over a week period or so. 
And um, with web, we're expecting maybe 1,200 to 15, 1,800 the first time. Um, that competition is steep. Uh, typically, with Hubble, it's one in five or one in six proposals will get selected. With web, early on, it's probably gonna be closer to one in 10. And um, once that proposal is judged on its scientific merit, the science committee says, the science reviewers say, yes, this is a proposal that should be done. They make a recommendation to me as director. And I say, that sounds like a good idea to me. And uh, we ask them then for that full observing specification. Um, so they tweak the observing specification using the software and the tools that we've given them. Uh, that goes to our planning and scheduling team. The long range planners produce a calendar that's appropriate for about a whole year with all of the observations that were selected. And then each week, they pull from that calendar the set of observations that we're gonna do for a week and we upload the commands to the observatory to execute those particular observations. The observations get executed, the engineering and uh, science telemetry come back down. We unpack that, we calibrate the science data for them using the science data itself and the engineering data. And then we put it into uh, the archive at the Space Telescope Science Institute. The observer then comes in, uses our tools, their tools to extract that data and to do the science. To start, the proprietary period on those data is a year for, um, for, for most of the smaller programs. For the big programs, it's about six months. Um, for any observations that I award as director with my discretionary time, it's no proprietary period. And so I've already selected about 500 hours of time that's going to be used at, in the very early parts of the uh, observations, and that will be available to everybody everywhere. Um, we're quickly moving to a lower and lower pr proprietary period for uh, astronomical data, right? Uh, I, I, which I think is a very good thing. Did I hear applause? And, and so, um, you know, if in my perfect world, all of the data would be non-proprietary immediately. Um, but this is how it was established uh, for web. But the key is that this is peer reviewed. Anyone can apply. Absolutely. And once it's in the archive and it's gone past the, non, past the proprietary period, anyone in the world with an internet connection can download it. So you gotta have your DOS machine really well tuned up. Okay, there's one question here, but then we have two in the planetarium. Yes. What recommendation would I have for somebody entering the field of astronomy and astrophysics? Um, I would say if it's something that you're really interested in, uh, make sure that you uh, you, st you study hard uh, and that you, you, know, you really are interested in it, you make sure that uh, you have a good math background, uh, make sure that you have a good science background, uh, make sure that you go to a school where uh, you can interact with your professors and others and really um, begin projects in the field early, you know, I, I was lucky. I was able to actually do some hands-on projects in those laboratories that I was talking about. That makes a big impact. A lot more fun too. And yeah, a lot more fun. And hey, you may even earn a few bucks over the summer doing it, which is great. Um, and then uh, there, are, there are loads of opportunities out there. So um, I say, if you're interested, go for it. There's also uh, lots of internships and summer programs that you can um, take uh, part of, um, at the government centers, at Goddard, at JPL, within industry, companies like Northrop Grumman um, uh, sponsor lots of interns. We at the Institute uh, typically have a in, uh, summer intern program uh, as well. You can find out information about that on our website. Um, I guess I would just say be curious um, and be persistent. And we've got explainers who are learning astronomy by showing our telescope and how to use it to the public. So you, we have those kinds of uh, programs as well, but that's just a um, uh, selfless uh, plug. Now, 
a uh, few questions from the planetarium, and then, by the way, the observatory is open. It's clear. And uh, have, a, have a look. I'm not sure what they're looking at. Maybe, uh, the I don't know what, but. Can I, I just follow up one more sure. question, uh, comment on that last question? Um, there are many ways to participate in programs like this that don't require you to be an astronomer like me. Um, there are thousands of people across the country whose skills and talents are necessary, not just to build this machine, but to make its results available to the world. Uh, like I said earlier, educators, graphic artists, uh, business resource people, IT people. Number All crunchers. of these have to, pardon? Number crunchers. Number crunchers, yeah. People who actually enjoy working with numbers. All of these people have to, a lot of us do. I, I, do, I do math problems to put myself to sleep at night. It drives my wife crazy, but I do. Um, <laughs> probably too much information. Should, uh, should we switch to the planetarium? Yeah, let's go to the planetarium. Okay, Plan anyway, anyway the, 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 the upside of that is there are lots of ways that you can participate, and we need lots of different kinds of talents to make these kinds of big projects possible. Exactly. Planetarium, questions? Um, my question is, how could we be more intentional in taking advantage of gravitational lensing to extend the effective, effective range of our space instruments? Wow, what a great question. Uh, for, the, for the questioner, have you heard of the frontier fields? No. No, okay. Uh, Hubble recently did a program called the frontier fields where we do just that. We use uh, gravitational lensing, which is um, uh, a phenomenon by which uh, you've got a mass in space and it warps the space around it, right? This is something that Albert Einstein predicted. You put a mass into space and it warps the space time around it to continue. And what happens is that mass actually acts as a lens. So an object behind that mass, when it's viewed from your side, the light comes around that mass, it gets bent, and it gets magnified. It might get distorted, but it also gets magnified. And so that's called gravitational lensing. And so the, the light looks different than it would look if the lens weren't there, if that mass weren't there. Well, we've used that technique recently with Hubble in a program called the Frontier Fields to actually look deeper into space than we can look um, just normally in a field like the deep field. Um, and by using that cosmic lens, it's like putting a big telescope out there, using the, teles using the universe as a telescope, using that um, cluster as a telescope to magnify that light. And some of the most distant objects we've seen in the universe are a result of that. The fact that that light has been lensed and magnified on its way to us. If that lens weren't there, we wouldn't have seen those galaxies with Hubble. Right? So we're going to definitely exploit that with Webb as well. And in fact, that's probably our best way of probing the very most distant objects by getting that boost in amplification, that little bit of extra oomph uh, beyond what we would just get with the mirror itself. Yeah, that's real science fiction in my mind. Boy, that's incredible. One more question from the planetarium and then we'll have to uh, close up. Oh, that's a good question. Um, we're not too worried about space debris with James Webb. Let us know if you, <laughs> you know something we don't know. Um, there's no, not too much junk out there, is there, what you're saying? Um, out at L2, there's not too much junk, actually. It's actually a fairly clean um, region relative to, say, lower Earth orbit, where there's lots of junk floating around. Um, and that, a lot of that's man-made debris, obviously. We've already messed up lower Earth orbit. Yeah. Um, with Webb, uh, we probably will not have to take much in the way of uh, defensive action for um, debris. Um, one of the reasons that we've got a five-layer sunshield is that we expect there will occasionally be micrometeorites or something that come through um, those layers. And the fact that there's five layers means that it's going to be penetrating those layers on an angle. And so the chance of it coming through in a way that allows 
light to eventually pass through to hit the mirror is probably pretty small. All of those calculations have been worked and I've been assured that we don't have to worry about that. <laughs> if you look at an observatory like Hubble, Hubble's mirror, even though we've been pointing at the sky now for 28 years, the, the mirror quality is almost as good. Um, it's indistinguishable from when it was launched. And so um, in that respect, uh, you know, the micrometeorite damage isn't too bad. On the other hand, if you look at one of Hubble's transmitters, there's a, there's a hole this size in it, and that was a close call for the observatory. So it can happen, um, but out, out at L2, it's a lot cleaner than it is in low Earth orbit, so we, we should be pretty good there. Yeah, another gr good reason for being there. Okay, well, I want to thank everybody. We're a good bit over our time. Uh, the observatory is open. I want to invite you back uh, in May when Jennifer Wiseman will uh, explore the other 95% of the universe that we ignored today. Thank you so much.